Jack, the latest episode in this battle for third place, but obviously going head to head with Aberdeen for that spot. Were you surprised? And what were your thoughts actually on, on Derek's news when he departed earlier on in the week? Um, I think to begin with, like I, I think I've said, probably feels like all too often this season in terms of the number of managerial changes there's been. That I think when you do the job that I do and, and others do in the league, you have the most respect for those that do it, and then therefore you have um, always a sense of disappointment when anybody loses their job. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I've mentioned on a number of occasions previously how good Derek's been to me during my managerial career um, from back when I started at Alloa. Um, right up until, um, you know, I lost my job at Sunderland, the, the time he spent speaking to me and advice he's given me. And I've utmost respect for um, Derek as a person and what he's achieved as a manager. So disappointed to see him um, leave, even though it's against, obviously, a team that we've, we've been pretty much competing with all season to finish in that position in the league. Is it just part and parcel of the game, Jack, when you're a manager and you're, yeah, the rewards are high, but the, you know, if you, if, even if you fall a little bit short, you know, mm. and, and that's obviously what, what the, the Aberdeen board seem to think that this season it's not been as good as what they were expecting it to be. That the the price you pay is is by your job. I think we live in a world in a world nowadays where um, people want change continuously. There's a demand for change continuously, whether it's right or wrong, or justified or unjustified. Um, I think the average tenure now for managers is get shorter and shorter with each passing season. I think within our own league to see the numbers that have, um, have obviously changed or lost their job over the course of this season, no, not even season, um, the season that's yet to be completed, I think illustrates that. So it's a precarious profession. I think people always acknowledge that. But it's not complaining about it. It's our choices to, to to want to work in this field and try and have a long career in it. But it's um, arguably harder than it's ever been, I think, to... Um, of longevity in any role and how that um, how you're perceived as being successful. Um, so, as I said, I don't see it changing anytime soon. I think it's the, the current climate, the current culture. Um, and unless something dramatic changes, then it's, uh, managers will accept that they have to um, be incredibly good to try and stay in a job, which is um, remarkable to say that to, you have to be really good to stay in a job, never mind actually be seen as being successful. You say it's, it's harder than it's, it's ever been, but there's for every managerial vacancy, there's always a whole host of manager or people who are looking for that job. What is it, Jack, that that, that drives people on to this position and the knowledge that you know, the likelihood is that you're going to get a sack one day? Well, I think there'll be there'll be various answers and and from various individuals. I think there'll be. Um, I think there's like any position of power or leadership, there's the perceived kudos that goes with that and recognition that you've been having certain qualities and being, um, I think some people yearn to be seen as a leader and be in charge and it's why, why some people want to be promoted to be a manager of an organisation or a supervisor or whatever it may be. Um, I think that some of the people that would put themselves forward to be a manager maybe don't quite understand what it's like and don't quite understand the qualities you need to have, but they'll find that they only find that out when they get to do the job as well. So I think there'll always be a long list of people who will want to be considered to be a manager at any club because um, they'll believe they have the qualities to do so. And ultimately the, the time will tell or the proof will be in the quality of their work. But um, as you rightly said, Brian, as much as it's, it's becoming more and more difficult, it doesn't seem to be putting people off and I don't see that changing either. You're taking on a man on Saturday who um, has been in and out of work. He was out it for for a period of time. He's now come back in. I don't think anybody can argue that, that John Hughes is mentally strong. That that's one of the strengths that's required, though, isn't it? To, to be yeah. Um, I mean, I think you have to. I think to be successful in any walk of life, you have to have a degree of resilience and, and mental toughness to. Um, because unless you're incredibly lucky, you're going to have rejection and failure along the way, and you're going to have dips. Um, going back to the current climate, the managers operate in and the challenges they face. I think you also have to develop almost rhino skin as well, um, because you get peppered with criticism um, from various quarters, and said sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's not. But you have to be, um, I think, have that mental fortitude to 
to um, to want to continually do it. And yeah, I think we all know that Jordan, I think, has proven he's got that in terms of both his playing career and then most relevant to the conversation we're having and his coaching and management career as well. You keep freezing there, Jack. Yeah. Um, Jack, it is the first time we've spoken to you since, since Rangers have won the league. Um, were they winners in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I'll always say that a league table will tell the story of a season um, because it's you know a 38 game season and obviously we're not at that stage yet. But I think the team that comes out on top is the best team in the league, and to win the stage, the win, sorry, the championship this stage of the season shows that they've been um, they've been far ahead of any other competitors in that respect and been incredibly consistent as well. So no, I think lovely winners deserve winners of the championship this season. We spoke to your, your good friend and, and former manager, John Yogi Hughes, earlier today, who said to us that he'll be able to name your squad, your, your starting lineup, no bother, and to make sure he told you that. Um, what, what have you made of the job that he's doing up at Ross County? I think, first of all, he's saying that because I did a, um, I did a Q&A one night and he was involved with Hibs TV doing it, and I threw him under the bus and telling Hibs fans that he... When he was my manager at Falkirk, always made great, uh, took great enjoyment at telling us he knew Hibs team before we played them. So um, I think that's where he's probably coming back at me for that. But I think that um, it doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, we enjoyed some good times at Falkirk in terms of the progress that club made and where that club was at that time. You know, we were challenging as a top six Premiership club. Um, and I think that he's um, he has an enthusiasm and a passion in, in, about the game that is vital to have. And then I think he's astute in his work as well. He's got good ideas for the game. And I think he backs his ideas as well. So I've not been surprised that he's um, been galvanised in that period. We know that firsthand from the game at Easter Road um, a couple of months ago. And obviously, again, the last couple of results that they've had, or, or two or three of the last results, have put them in a, in a position where they can be competitive to retain their place in the league as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, what, what parts of John Hughes's management stand out for you and your memories as a, as a player under him? Um, I think that, I mean, I think probably one of the one of the most interesting aspects of it, and it's more specific than a generalisation, was we, um, I think it was the, the pre-season leading up to our second season back in the Premiership, and um, we went to Holland pre-season. And we played Dronigan, who had just recently qualified for the Champions League, who played a midfield diamond, and both fullbacks played high on the pitch at the same time. And is that at that time, I think that was back 2005, 2006 time. Nobody was really doing it in Scotland, and we had a meeting post that game. And um, you know, we told us that's how we were going to play from then on. And so we, um, yeah, I mean, that was an example, I think, of his willingness to probably think about differently and be brave enough to go and try playing a different way. And I think we went on to, um, to enjoy success in terms of playing that system, I think if those that remember that team that Russell Latt put at the top of Diamond and Alan Gow and Anthony Stokes up front and average fullbacks like me playing in it, I think we were a, we were a good side at that time. But that, that was just one example, I think, of his um, how he was always prepared to think a little bit differently. He's always wanted to have a particular style of play, isn't he? He's always you know been very strong minded on that. And even when he's he's he's, he's in a, a relegation battle at the moment, he's taking on previous jobs where it's about keeping the team up. You need a, a mental strength to, to want to put your values onto a team when you're you know in a bit of a scrap, as it is. Yeah, I mean, I think, as I said earlier, I think he's shown that, that fortitude, I think, to um, even want to keep, keep coming back into managing as well, because like, in the day that has a, has a longish career and he's, he's, he's enjoyed some success, he's in some good times and he's had some bumps along the way as well. And, it's the ability to bounce back from those setbacks and keep doing what you want to do and keep believing in it. So I said, I think he's, he's, he's experienced enough and proven enough now in management to have illustrated that time after time. Jack, um, I just wanted to ask you about uh, a few players. First of all, Kevin Nisbet, Ryan Porteous, I think they started for the first time uh, at the weekend since the transfer window. Do you, do you think they're back to their best, both on, on the park in training and mentally? Well, I think that um, what I would say is that neither of them were in that respect. So they, they came out of the team around the time of the, the speculation and a comment in that at the time in terms of the challenges for them as a young player. And that coincided with us having a, a really good period in terms of results and performances and players that had waited patiently to play 
were earning the right to keep hold of that jersey. So there was no real, um, there was nothing sinister behind the out of the team other than players that came in playing really well. Um, and I think then when they came on in games, they had contributed. Um, I think Ryan in particular, obviously, as a defender, sometimes that impact can be less obvious. I think naturally, as you're a striker, it can, you can have probably a greater impact in the game, but Ryan's came on in games and, and looked to be right at it. So um, I think they've waited patiently for that opportunity and it was good to, to get them back in starting games as well. And just on uh, and Jackson, who we just spoke to, he was saying that physically wise, he's almost felt as if he's been in pre-season since, since he joined, but I think he's started every game since he's come in. Did you expect him to be at such a high level? Um, well, we, we had to probably, it was an educated gamble from our respect because we, we weren't at the stage of the season we were bringing in, we couldn't afford to wait four to six weeks for him to be up to speed. Um, otherwise, it would have been it wouldn't have been worth, uh, from his point of view and our point of view, in terms of bringing him to the club. So, based on his, his previous history, the number of games he's played, his all-round fitness in general, he'd, he'd been training at Oldham previous to him coming to here. So, we felt as if, well, I suppose, taking as much as we could into account, we felt as if he'd be almost ready to go. And But I think he has, he certainly surprised me in the early games at, um, at where he was at. I think maybe he's had a little bit of a dip in, in the last couple of games where by it sometimes happens. But he's looked, in training over the kind of last five, six days again, he's looked as if he's, um, I think he's getting fitter and stronger again, which is obviously encouraging for us. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Uh, Jack, just going back on the sort of time that managers get, I think now that you're the, the fourth longest serving manager in the Premiership, despite the fact you've only sort of been in the job just eight months, it just, is, it just, is that, I know you've already touched on it a bit, but given that you're the fourth longest, it just shows the, t- the lack of time managers again. Yeah, it's just probably a really good illustration of it. You know, I wasn't aware of that. Um, quite surprised by it, to be honest, that it's not. I suppose it's not a particularly brilliant statistic in terms of um, offering managers comfort about um, me included about um, how long you stay in a job and how much time you get to try and improve a club. But um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it has been something that has been um, more common across all leagues and across most countries. And as I said, unless there's a sometimes these things are cyclical and, and they come back around that managers have a longer period to and have and have greater. Um, time afforded to them, but certainly the current climate we're working is that the managers have to be and produce results quickly and consistently um, in, in order to, to retain the role. In your head, have you got sort of, because Derek McInnes was in the job eight years, might not be as long as that, but have you sort of got a time frame in your head that how long it would take for you to fully put your stamp on a club? Um, I could do that. What was that? The one that was a few years ago, the 2020 vision for Scotland? Was that... <laughs> So if I say what well, maybe I would, what's about a twenty thirty five vision for Hibs, does that get, does that bag me enough time? Um, Just about. I think that look, I, I I want to stay in the job as long as I can. I think that you know when you when you attend coaching courses or you participate in them, and or certainly when I was younger and I was doing them, they talk about you know a one year plan, a three year plan, a five year plan, and it's all very well good in theory. It's nice to talk about that, but the truth is, as a manager, you just got to keep getting results to to give you that longevity in the role. And um, that's really my focus. Um, you know, I, I can have input in how we build other areas of the club, but, but every single week, sometimes more than once a week, it's about just making sure I, I can put a team on the pitch to win games. Um, and if I do that, then, then I'll enjoy a longer spell here. On the weekend then, um, how's your squad looking after the last couple of weeks? Um, yeah, we're okay. We've just got... Um, Sean Mackey remains absent. Um other than that, we're okay. We're, we're reasonably fit and healthy, which is good because obviously I spoke about tight numbers in terms of the squad. So we have um, everybody else available at this thing stand. Will you be texting Yogi your team tomorrow morning, Jack? <laughs> I might as well because you'll find out anyway. So I'll maybe just send him it. <laughs> Cheers, Jack. Good luck. Cheers, thank, thank you, Jack. Good luck. Cheers, thank you. Bye. Have a good day.